We wish to extend a warm welcome to all of you who may be visiting with us. We will say a little bit more about that a little later. We know that it is because of the occasion of, of at least two events that I know of. Uh, the first uh, is uh, Emma Cadet. She is celebrating her birthday and her family and her friends uh, are with her. We wish to congratulate her on reaching that milestone. Additionally, uh, dear sister uh, Alva is celebrating and she has her friends and her family with her. So as you see them, please wish them a, a happy birthday. Uh, we also, I also understand it is Katie's birthday uh, today also. Uh, I, like I said, what I know, <laughs> I would speak. Uh, Kato made sure that I knew that this is Mom's birthday. Happy birthday, Katie. Um, we have been announcing over the last couple of weeks that our dear brother Eric Albury and his dear wife have rejoined this congregation. Uh, Eric has rejoined and he is now again serving in the capacity of an evangelist. So uh, you will be seeing him before us uh, beginning as early as next month with the Bible class. Uh, he will be traveling. Uh, for about two weeks or so, so you would miss his presence in our assembly. Uh, we are indeed uh, appreciative of all of you who would have assembled here, uh, not only those who are visiting, but those of us who, uh, through our obligation and our commitment to uh, our God and to this fellowship, uh, we have assembled in this place this day. Jesus in Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 26. He said, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? These words of Jesus challenges us to consider the value of a never dying soul. Every one of us that are assembled in this place today, we share a common possession and that is we all have a soul. The soul that we possess is more valuable than the most palatial home that you can imagine and, and no doubt there are a lot of examples to uh, compare it to. It is more valuable than the most luxurious car, and there are indeed a lot of luxurious cars in which to compare it to. Our soul is more precious than the, more precious than the jewels that one can assemble. Taking the time to safeguard your soul is more important than any venture or endeavor that you may be minded to embark, to embark upon. Securing your soul is more important than the pursuit of wealth and power. It is more important than careers and the personal aspirations that we may have. It is even more important than the relationships that we may currently share or the relationships that we may desire to pursue. These words of Jesus are indeed sobering and they challenge us to consider those questions concerning our soul. And if we are sober-minded and if we are honest with ourselves, we will arrive at the correct question to those direct, correct answers to those questions. And indeed, we can only conclude that there is absolutely nothing in this world. Even if we were to be given this world on a platter, that would be more valuable than the soul that God has placed within us. Do you understand the value of your soul? I want to take this knowledge that I just shared with you and challenge you today to secure your soul. 
And I want you to consider with me today this question, are you ready to die? You know, in this life we face lots of distractions. But we must take the time to secure our soul before we meet our God. In this season and in this time, in particular, there are distractions that will come. But the wise man tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse number 1 through 2, that there is a time and there is a season for every activity under heaven. He tells us that there is a time to be born and we have passed that stage. And he tells us that there is also a time to die and that is a stage that will come to many of us. In another place, Solomon tells us, for the living know that they will die. Ecclesiastes 9 and 5. Further, the great writer of the book of Hebrews reminds us of the common destiny that we as humans share. And he tells us in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 27 that it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. And so my question to you today is simple and direct. Are you ready to die? This is indeed an appropriate question for us to consider because death is lurking in the shadows, seeking to reveal itself. And the prophet Amos tells us in Amos chapter 4 and verse number 12. He gave some advice to Israel, and this advice he gave to Israel is indeed poignant and sober today as it was in the day in which he uttered those words. And he said to them, simply prepare to meet thy God. And again, this is an appropriate warning for men of all generations. Because we do not know when we will be called away in debt. And it is because we do not know when that we must prepare to meet our God. And so I again ask you, are you ready to die? Each Thursday, many of us purchase the newspaper. And they tell me that Thursday paper sells more than every other paper. Everybody is interested in getting this. And it is interesting, I had occasion to my busy schedule this week, I tend to stop looking at these because I'm too busy to look at these things, but a colleague of mine highlighted this week, because we were looking because we had a colleague in the bank that died. And the, the comment was, there are more young people than there are old people in the paper. And I asked my wife last night, let me see the paper. I wanted to see what he, if he was saying was so. And she gave me the paper on December 8th. And you check it out. Check it out for me. And if they believe you could pass it around too. There are more young people there than old. Most people there are under 16. In their 30s, young people. You know, I used to hear when I was a young boy. They used to say, here today gone tomorrow. That saying, that saying is now a change. Here today and gone today. There, there is a lot of talk about individuals who may be on those pages. And you may perhaps hear some people say that some of these individuals perhaps may have gone too soon or uh, their death was sudden. And I, I, I tend to hear that a lot, particularly among the young, and particularly among those who were not known to, to be sick. Or even those who were sick, they perhaps we did not know that their sickness was unto death. But there's talk that they are here today and gone today, or they died suddenly or untimely because those things are indeed happening 
People are leaving this earth. And because this is happening, again I ask, are you ready to die? We tend to fear death. We fear it because we tend not to understand it. There is widespread misunderstanding about what happens when one dies. And this misunderstanding and this fear for death has handicapped a lot of us and it helps, it, it, it stops us from truly appreciating the value of our soul and taking the time to care for our souls because we do not understand death. Death is far too frequent in, in this world, the occurrence of death. And many of us do not appreciate how short the time we have in this life is. We believe that we have a lot of time, but time is short. And I know that perhaps many of us believe that uh, we will have next year to do so and so and to do this and to do the other. But how do you know? This question concerning death is one that even the righteous ask. And I draw to your attention the righteous, the righteous man Job as he pondered on this subject of death and he asks if a man die Shall he live again? Job 14, 14. And the others wonder, what is there beyond the grave? Or does death end it all? There are various thinking and schools of thoughts concerning death. And this causes a lot of confusion among the masses. There are those who are atheists who claim not to believe or accept God as God. And they argue, they would argue with you that all thoughts of death are only dreams. All thoughts of death and the afterlife are only dreams. They believe that man and animal are alike. And they are simply products of chance. And that they are all destined to suffer the same fate. But that is a lie. There are those who are classified as skeptics. They cannot come to any conclusion concerning this matter. Because they can't find nothing to validate or to verify. And so they refuse to believe. There are those who accept and embrace reincarnation. There are those who believe that this life that they live is perhaps one of many lives that they will experience in the cycle of death and births and death. There is confusion that about. There are those who will tell you that once you are dead that you are asleep and that the, the spirit is unconscious. There are others who believe in purgatory. And they will tell you that once a person is dead, that you can pray a person out of this state of purgatory into the more pleasant place. But that teaching is foreign to the scriptures. As you can see, there are wide and there are varying views concerning this thing called death and what happens after one dies. So how can we know? How can we accept what is right? I want to lead you to God's words. Because his word is crystal clear concerning this subject. We know that God's word is infallible and that it is inspired. 
And there are a lot of evidences in God's word concerning this matter that it could help us to develop our faith and our trust. That it would equip us also to, to face our debt and to prepare ourselves and our soul for what is to come after we leave this place. I want to say to you that death is the enemy. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 26, we told that the last enemy that must be destroyed or that shall be destroyed is death. And we knew that Jesus conquered death. He was put to death, but he was resurrected from the dead. Death comes and it, it is very painful and it interrupts. And it tears the hearts of individuals. And I was to a funeral yesterday. And I see the pain and I saw the pain that it brought to that family. And to those who knew the one that uh, passed away. Death destroys. That goes back to the first man and the first woman in the garden or Eden. Because of their disobedience. And because they ate the forbidden fruit, death came to them in two forms. First, they experienced the, the spiritual death in as much as they were separated from God. And in time, they would have endured the physical death that would have taken them from this life into the next. I want to say to you today that death is indeed a separation. When the soul leaves the body, death occurs. In James chapter 2 and verse number 26, he tells us that the body without the spirit is dead. Additionally, we are told in Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 28, that we ought not to fear them that could kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. In other words, there are two parts to every individual, the body and the soul. And I guess your question is then, what is the soul? The soul of man is that conscious, that non-material part, that part that we cannot touch or feel, that continues beyond death apart from the body. It's important for us to understand that the soul is different from the body. I think it's easy for us to understand what the body is. It is that material part, that part that we can touch, that we can see, that we can feel. I want you to turn to me in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 39. The soul is, is really and truly who we are. It's who we are on the inside. We usually use the physical characteristics to distinguish people. But a lot of times, if you want to get to a deeper level, you can truly get to know an individual on the inside. Then you really and truly get to see who they are. And you're told that the soul is that part that needs to be safe. In death, this body is buried. This body may be cremated. This body may go to ashes and be spread to the sea, may be lost in the sea, it may be destroyed. But the soul is that element that needs to be saved. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 39, we are told, But we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but we are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So it is, the, the body is that is not saved, it is the soul that requires saving. And it's the soul that lives on and it's the soul that you must secure. Again, in James chapter 1 and verse number 21, we told that we ought to therefore rid ourselves of all suddenness and rank, growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness, the in, implanted word that has the power to save your souls. So the soul is that element that is safe. There's very little that we can do with this body at this state. But it is the soul of man that we ought to be concerned about. And it is your soul that we are concerned about 
this day. It's the soul that God desires to save. All of us have a divine appointment. All of us, should Christ delay his coming, will experience death. Not one of us will escape it again if he continues to delay his coming. We all will die one day. But are you ready to die? So what happens? We know that there are funerals that take place. And we know that after the funerals, traditionally we take the body and we bury the body and we put them six feet under. Sometimes we, we create or cremate the individual. We scatter the ashes or we keep the ashes. But what about the soul? What do we do with the soul? What does the Bible say that happens to the soul? I want to suggest to you that there are four things that happen when one dies. And it's important for us to understand all four of these things. Because if we do, we will see that we ought to take those measures to secure the soul that we have. And when we experience that, we are told that the soul leaves the body. But where does it go? We're going to get there. I want you to uh, look at 1 Kings chapter 17, verse number 21. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse number 21. The prophet Elijah, he helps us to understand what happens at death. And he also helps us to understand that there is body and then there is soul. In context, the man of God has been staying with this widow and this widow had a son. And the son became ill and the son died and and the man of God saw the distress and the pain and the sadness that this woman had experienced. And he decided to intercede and he approached God on her behalf. And in verse number 21 we are told, And he stretched himself upon the child three times and he cried to the Lord and he said, My Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come unto him again. Bear in mind now. The child would have died. But what is he praying? What is he asking God for? Y'all can talk to me. He wants the soul to come back. Where was the body? It was present there with him. But the soul would have left the body. So he's praying to God that God would send the soul back into the body. And in verse number 22 we are told that the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and he and the soul of the child came again into him and he revived so you see you see that principle body and soul when the soul leaves the body death occurs when the soul returns to the body life returns in this occasion life usually don't return the soul don't usually return to the body unless it's a miracle so the soul doesn't sleep. The soul is not unconscious. Where does the soul go in death? Tell me in Luke chapter 16. There is an interesting story there in Luke. Because it tells us and it helps us to understand and it helps us to, to see how careful we ought to be with that thing called the soul that we possess. In Luke chapter 16 and verse number 19 says there was a certain man who was dressed in and purple and fine linen. And he fed sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar. We are told that there was a certain man. And there was a certain beggar. And his name was Lazarus. And he laid at his gate full of sores. And he desired to be fed the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died. And was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. So we see that they did something with the body of the rich man. They buried him. We're not told about the burial of, of Lazarus. But no doubt the rich man had a, 
a good friend or a good son away. And he was buried. But in voice number 23, in hell he lift up his eyes, or Hades, your version may say. In hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and see Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And the Hadidian, the Hadidian world is, is a realm where the, the spirit of the dead dwell. And in verse number 24, he cried and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And besides all this between us and you, there is a great gulf that's fixed. And so that they which pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would have sent him to my father's house. So Lazarus died. He was in Abraham's bosom. The rich man died. He was in torment. Both in the Hadean world, but a gulf in between, a gulf was fixed in between so that where the rich man was, the, uh, Lazarus could not come. And where Lazarus was, the rich man could not come. And there was no reversing of their positions. That automatically canceled out purgatory. They could not switch over, could not visit him, could not come and dip the tip of his finger in the coolest tongue. It was a permanent arrangement. It was important that we understand this because the only chance we have is in this life. So what that, there are two destinations. One in Abraham's bosom and one in torment. To which place do you want to go? I know a lot of us can't take heat. You cut this air conditioner off now, everybody will file and time. Get out of here and we'll get out of here. Why don't we want to get out of hell? Let's do the same thing. So their fate were fixed. It was based on what they did in the life that they had. But more importantly, I want you to see here that there is, coming out in this text, there's a consciousness. They had, this, this rich man had memory and he had feelings. He was in discomfort and he was not happy and he wanted some relief. But I think the greatest punishment there was he had memory. And he said, son, remember in our, in our lifetime you had all the good things and Lazarus didn't have anything? Yes. Can you imagine yourself in this man's position? God forbid, but... Can you imagine if you uh, refuse to obey the gospel and you end up in hell in, this, in the Hadean realm? How you would the regrets that you would have because you would have not given yourself over to God because you were too busy you had other things to do it was not on your priority list because you wanted to wait to the last moment you know we behave as we like to wait to the last minute but if you were to die today where would you be? In Abraham's bosom or in torment? And he had memory and he, asked, he was told that no, we cannot send anyone back to your father's house. No doubt he wanted that because he had brothers. And he knew that they were just like him and he did not want them to come to that place that he was in. He had some regrets.
can you imagine yourself? Just think of some decisions that we would have made in life that would have resulted in us regretting that we took a certain course of action. If you felt terrible about those decisions, imagine the magnitude of the regret that you will have if you reject God and you end up in hell. I said to you that there are four things that follow that. The first is that upon that, the soul is transported to the Hadean world, either in Abraham's bosom or in torment. I say to you, secondly, there is a resurrection. One day, the body that is buried six feet under, or those who perhaps may have been cremated, or those whose bodies were destroyed or lost at sea, we are told that there's going to be a resurrection. In John chapter 5, verse number 28 through 29, we told marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. In Acts 24 and verse number 15, the latter part of that, it says, There shall be a resurrection of the dead, both the just and the unjust. The just and the unjust. How would you categorize yourself? The righteous or the unrighteous? At the resurrection, we will be changed and be told that it's going to be instantaneous. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 21. We're told that Jesus shall change our wild bodies that it may be fashioned unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Our bodies will be changed and made into a glorious body. And I know some of us got some, some conditions with our bodies. I know when I sit down and I start up, I got to take my time because of these aches and these pains. Some of us got some challenges in the flesh, but... Uh, God going to deal with those things. If not now, well, he's going to eventually deal with them. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 2. After that, what happens? Again, it said to you that the soul takes a journey. It's transported to one of two destinations in the Hadean world, to, to Abraham's bosom or the torment, or the, or the torment and punishment. Secondly, at the second coming of Christ, when Christ comes again, there's going to be that great resurrection. The Hebrew writer tells us as much. When he warned us that everyone will die, but once we die, we understand that there is the judgment to come. Who will be this judge? Jesus. In John 5 and 22, for the Father judges no man. But he committed all judgment unto the Son. Christ has been given the power by God to judge us. Paul, as he spoke to the Romans, the church in Rome, in Romans chapter 14 and verse number 10, he says to the latter parts, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There is no way for us to duck out. I know there are ways for us to get off the jury. We, get, um, we could call someone and Put a little string here and there. We know how to get off and get around different things. When we go to the road traffic, some of us when we go to road traffic, we don't know in total those long lines. We got we put some strings. But there are no strings to be pulled here. No strings. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You know back door there. I know some of us can't make it without a back door. Romans 4 and wisdom 11 says, For it is written, as I live, said the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. If you refuse to bow now, you will be forced to bow then. 
Every tongue shall confess God. And so then every one of us shall give an account to himself to God. Get rid of that dirt now, man. Why you want to take all that baggage with you? Jettison that baggage. Because you got to give an account. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 51 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. At the end of time of the second coming of Christ, the souls that are in the Hadean world, in Hades, that are in either Abraham's bosom or in torment, and those bodies that are in the grave shall be resurrected. And First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 13, as I hasten on, says, but we, but I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren. And I don't want you to be ignorant concerning this matter either. Concerning them which had fallen asleep, that he sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will, will God bring with him. The dead in Christ got to hook up. You want to hook up? You hook up now. That's your back door pass. Verse number 15. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that, which, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, so if you survive and you didn't die, shall be changed. So sorry, we should be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And we shall be ever, and we shall ever be with the Lord. That's a glorious day. But that's a glorious day for those who are straight. For those who ain't straight, that's not going to be a pleasant day. There's a judgment that we're facing. Revelation chapter 20, verse number 12. And I saw the dead. Watch this now. I saw the dead, the big shot, the great and the small, standing before the throne. So everyone who believed this, all of that in this side, they can be humble. They can bow. They can give an account. Those who believe they don't have to answer anyone. It says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. And other books were open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. Not according to what somebody make up and put on them, but according to their works. But they did. I know some of them say, well, I remember doing that, but hey, it's still, it is written. Verse number 13, and the sea gave up the dead that were in it. And watch this now. And, the, and, the, and dead and Hades, remember that Hadean world where there was Abraham's bosom and then there was in torment. And dead and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. So those who don't believe in that the Hadean world exists. Here we go. Confirm. And they were judged every man according to their works. Not according to what was put on them. Verse number 14. And dead and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second dead. Even the lake of fire. And if any was not found written in the book of life. He was cast into the lake of fire. Those whose name were not found written in the book of life. 
were cast into the fire. You all know you all don't like hot. You all don't like heat. After death, the soul takes a journey. It goes to one of two places. You're living for God, Abraham's bosom, serving the devil, torment. The second coming of Christ, there will be a resurrection. Then we will stand before God in judgment. And then there is eternity. Eternity is good news for those who are obedient to God. But it is bad news for those who are lost. Because you only got an appetizer in the Hadian world in that torment section. That was just the appetizer. The main cause is to come. I want you to focus on heaven. Heaven is a place without some things. There no sorrow in heaven. There's no more tears in heaven. There's no pain and there's no more death. There's no more night, no, no evil. Jesus will be there. Those great patriarchs that have gone before us is there. The faithful is there. God the Father is there. The thing question then is, will you be there? Hell, on the other hand, will be a place where there are some things. The only comparison between the two or close similarity between the two is, both is for eternity. There's going to be some fire there. There's going to be a little torment. Well, some torment. Meant much torment. You're going to have your memory there. There's going to be weeping and punishment and worms there. Now, you may say we need some gross things, but that's what the scripture describes it. If you don't like it, don't go there. And to top it off, Satan will be there. There will be no help. There is no second chance there. Hell is not a joke. That is not a joke. Being reckless and careless with your soul is no light matter. The good thing is, we do not have to go to hell. Jesus died on the cross to stop each and every one of us from going to hell. God has done his part. God desires for everyone to be safe. He does not want anyone to be lost. The problem is not with God, but the problem is with us. It's because we are hard-hearted, we are hard-headed. We don't listen, we refuse to believe. We like to hold on to traditions. We like to believe lies. We simply have to obey the gospel. I can tell you right now, Praying and asking Jesus to come into your heart, ain't going to do it. That ain't in the scriptures. Praying and putting your heart on the radio as a point of contact, ain't in the scriptures. Or the day, y'all don't even listen to the radio no more, and y'all put your hand on the TV. That ain't going to help you. You can't find that in the scripture. I think I probably could find $100 if anybody could find that in the scripture. Or I'll probably have to go get it, but I am sure you can't find it, so I know I ain't, gonna, I ain't have no risk of losing that. You ain't going to find it in the scriptures. Let me tell you what you will find. You'll find that you need to obey the gospel of Christ. The gospel simply is the preaching of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Hey, all this foolishness that these fellows around here with the hoarse voice and some kind on with. It is the preaching of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. That's what the gospel is. And most of us already believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Most of us accept that fact. The problem is that we, a lot of us got a problem with uh, allowing, having sufficient belief that will lead us to repentance. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change in direction in your life. You see, when you believe sufficiently enough, when you have faith sufficient enough to save you, 
It motivates you to go a little further than just to have an intellectual knowledge of God and, and a God and Jesus is God's son, just acknowledging those things. It pushes you a little further. It pushes you to say, man, look, I got to stop living how I live I got to turn towards God. So it's a change of life. Repentance is a change of life or change of mind that leads to a change of direction in your life. It is simply as though as I'm walking in this direction and if I stop and I say, well, I don't want to go in this direction anymore. Instead of saying I changed my mind, I could simply say, well, I repent of the direction I'm going. And by which, when I repent of the direction, if I truly repent, I will turn around and I will go in the next direction towards God. If you're willing to go that far, why not go a little further? Why not confess that Jesus is Lord? You know, I like to tell people that confession is uh, faith spoken. You're simply saying you're confessing what you believe. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then you should be willing to confess that. If you're willing to do that, why not go even a little further according to the Scriptures? Why not submit yourself to baptism? Let me tell you what baptism is not. Baptism is not sprinkling. It is not a pouring on. Baptism is a burial in water. Is being placed under the water. And I know some of us got uh, sprinkled and christened and stuff when we were kids. But the baptism that leads, that's unto salvation, is not, those, is not that. The baptism that is unto salvation is, once one hears the gospel, one believe it, one is willing to repent, willing to confess, then you are baptized. A child can believe. Baby can't believe. When you're baptized, the scripture tells us, according to Acts chapter 2, when we are baptized, we receive the remission of our sins, 2 and 38, the forgiveness of our sins, and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's no other way to God. Don't let no one fool you. You want to secure your soul? You've heard the gospel. The gospel ain't nothing like what these people want you to believe. It's simply the preaching, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. If you believe that, if you truly believe that, that will lead you to want to repent. And if you're willing to go that far, then you should be willing to go a little further and to confess what you believe, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And if you've gone that far, then you should be willing to submit yourself to baptism, as outlined in the Scriptures, following the example of the first century church, having your sins forgiven, just get a fresh start, a new leash on life, having your sins forgiven, securing your soul, if you put yourself in that position, then you need not fear death. Because when death comes, you are ready. You're ready to go. Obama's saying, fire it up. You're ready to go. When death comes, lurking in the shadows, you could say, come on out. Because I'm fired up and I'm ready to go. What would you do today? I don't want to encourage you to consider those things. Consider your soul. Do not leave this place today without giving serious consideration to your standing in God. I want to invite you to stand Eight, as our brother comes before us.